You send out a mailer. You get a response. You follow up and the seller says, by the way, I have another property I'd like to sell you. You do the comps and realize the buy price is about $75,000. What do you do? Do you turn it away because it's too pricey for your blood? No, you find an investor because the upside is huge. Today on the Land.MBA podcast, Dave and I are speaking with Reed Kurtenbach. Reed is an experienced and active investor in land deals. He's the land money guy. Find out how he vets potential partners, how he analyzes deals, and why smart money is the way to go. All this and more on the Land on MBA podcast. Hey, welcome, gentlemen. How are you today? Welcome to the Land.MBA podcast, everyone. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce Mr. Reed Kurtenbach uh, from Denver area, Colorado. And of course, my co-host, Howard Zonder. And I am your other co-host, David Van Steenkist. How are we today, gents? Great. Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Look forward to talking with you guys. Yeah, everything is great here, and uh, I'm really excited to have uh, Reed on the call today. I, I always call him Kurt. It's it's Reed Kurtenbach, but I somehow always call him Kurt Reedenbach. I don't know why, but at, at, <laughs> at any rate, uh, as as I hope uh, people, our, our longtime listeners of the show have come to realize, we we try to provide really really good value on this on this podcast, really good learning, and bring in some really awesome awesome people that are deeply experienced and knowledgeable in their, in their areas. And uh, it would be super, super helpful if you would help us in our journey in the podcast by subscribing, liking, sharing it so that we can get higher in the rankings, get a larger audience and be able to really continue to provide this, like this level of content at no cost for all of you. So if you could do that, we sure would appreciate it. And with that, I turn it back over to Dave. Let's get going. All right. All right. Reed. Good to see you, man. Um, so the topic of today, obviously, is funding land. And uh, Reed has been uh, funding land flippers for a little while now. Uh, he and I met through doing some deals together. Uh, we had uh, some uh, really good results from our partnership. And uh, we will most likely be doing more deals in the future as well. And uh, so uh, Reed and I were chatting and I wanted to bring him on. He had some really great points about if you're a land investor, you know, things to look for in a funder, things that funders look for in investors uh, or operators. Um, and, um, you know, some of the, the, uh, the do's and the don'ts and the, and the highs and lows. So we're going to talk about some of those bullet points today. But Reed, why don't you uh, start by uh, giving us your little bit of bio, a little bit of background, kind of where you came from and, and how you got into the land investing arena. Yeah, sure. Thanks again for having me, you guys. And I'm really excited to share any sort of knowledge I can with your listeners. Um, I'm an avid listener as well. I, I listen to you guys all the time. I really feel not to uh, boast, but I just feel like um, you guys really provide some solid feedback so and some solid information in each one of your your episodes so i'm excited to give some golden nuggets today or whatever i can share uh, to help your listeners so let's see uh both my wife and i have been investing in land uh and primarily funding land investors since 2019 and we do that all across the nation for various land investors and we really came into the sphere of land investing because our background is in manufactured housing. And so we first started investing in manufactured homes and mobile home parks. And then we moved into investing in manufactured homes with land. And sometimes those manufactured homes were burned up uh, and we just needed to replace that uh, manufactured home uh, that was on that land. So we would pull the home off and then in between that, sometimes someone would make us an offer on the land that we just couldn't refuse. Or sometimes we came across a manufactured home, but we didn't have any land to buy. Uh, so we would have to hunt down the land. And so 
I started getting curious after I sold, uh, bought and sold some land uh, for the manufactured homes with and without the manufactured home on the land. And I thought there's, you know, the profit was pretty good. So I thought, okay, well, there's got to be a market here. And so for land investing, and so I went on a couple different websites and found that there was a whole community full of people that were investing in land. And so I took a few courses, um, including yours, and um, really gained some knowledge and then quickly found out, you know, my passion is more so being the land funder, someone who actually funds land deals rather than someone that invests in land. So um, that's what we've been doing. And we take any of that revenue or that profit that we make from investing in land for others and we put that into longer term investments like self storage and mobile home parks and so forth. So hopefully that tells you a little bit about me. Excellent. So you're, you're basically taking, if we were to uh, uh, take a page out of, well, you're, you're taking the uh, instant cash and the temporary cash and put and reinvesting it into forever cash deals. Yes. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great model. Love it. And, uh, and, and, and something I like about, you know, when, once you're in the position to be able to do so, uh, you're, by funding land investors, you're creating a much more mm, passive approach, not totally passive, but um, certainly you're not having to deal with all the day-to-day -day, uh, mailing and, and taking phone calls and sales and all that stuff. Yeah. Let the operator do that, give them the capital and, um, let your capital work for you while the other guy's using his time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All about time, um, I, money, and energy, you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, yep. if you had, you try to get to the point where you have enough money so you can use other people's time and energy and just your money. And then you kick back and uh, you, you take your profits and go live a great life. <laughs> That's yeah, the goal. Nice. That's the goal. And then try to give, give it back in some way. I mean, for me, um, I believe in financial literacy. And so um, one of the questions that I always ask the land investors that I work with is what's your why? And my why is eventually yes. when I get to a point where time is, I, I can choose what I want to do um, the time, what I want to be able to do is give back in a way um, to this, I not to, to tout them, but um, when I was a young kid, I belonged to a bank that um, was just for kids. They're in Denver. It's called Young Americans Bank. And so I love it. They, they're the ones with the short countertops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so they uh, teach kids all about money. And I that had a huge impact on me. They taught me about stocks and bonds. And uh, I had my own savings account, my own credit card when I was 13. And so I thought... And they do startup competitions like Shark Tank style. And so I want to be able to give back to in that way. I'm already a mentor for them, but I want to be able to spend more of my time teaching classes and so forth for kids. So that's really eventually my goal because I feel like kids aren't getting that in public high school these days. I certainly love that. I don't think you know, they ever have. <laughs> this is a uh, this is almost like a daily conversation that David and myself and our and our other partner Philip. Um, have all the time, which is, you know, coaching always starts with the why, because if, if your only why is, oh, I want to make a lot of money, you're going to flame out because it's ultimately, it's just not an emotionally uh, satisfying enough answer. I mean, yeah. we work hard so that we can make money, but we make money so that we can achieve our dreams so that we can, you know, be, you know, give back to the, to the world, you know, whatever it is, you know, we have to connect emotionally to what really is it we're trying to accomplish with all this effort that we're putting forth. If it's just money, if that's the, the be all and end all, you know, so I can have a scorecard so I can show that I, I did better than the next guy. It's kind of shallow and uh, it probably is not sustainable in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So that's great. When, great. When things start, when things start getting hard, then you, you know, you, then you take the, make the easy decisions and that, and, and, and people, end up quitting you got to have a bigger a bigger why that hits you viscerally in the heart that's emotional that keeps you going keeps you going through the through the through the mistakes and the tough times and the times you lose a little bit of money um and or you know all the pitfalls we have so cool if you're listening to this podcast 
you already know that land is a relatively unknown niche of the multi-billion dollar real estate market with huge profit potential. Seriously, what other business delivers 200, 300, 1,000% return on investment deal after deal? If you're a realtor, wholesaler, house flipper, you know that competition is rising and it's getting harder to source good investment properties. Many of our students have already created new revenue streams with land and added six figures to their incomes. You don't need another course that promises the moon and then delivers an elementary school education. You need a proven program suitable to your experience and ambition. You need a land MBA. The land MBA is everything you need to blow it out in the land business. Courseware, mentorship, tools, community, and even deal funding. Look, because you're here listening to me, you know that Dave and I don't hold anything back. That's a founding principle we've had from the beginning. With the Land MBA, you get everything we have to offer. There are no upsells. And now, through popular demand, we've transformed our highly regarded one-to-one -one coaching program into a small group format at a fraction of the price. And for our debut program, we're offering a whopping 40% off the already amazing price. There are only three seats left, and then the price goes back to normal. So don't hesitate. Go right now to www.land.mba slash fortune. That's land.mba slash fortune. Let us help you create your next path to wealth. How do you analyze the deals that you're going to fund? If I could, Dave, before we get to that, yeah. just because I'm a, I'm a very process oriented guy, before we okay. get into the how do we analyze a deal, could we just talk for a minute on how do you choose who to work with? Okay. Uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I, and I'll just kind of preface it by saying that, you know, my experience working with investors in not only in land, but in other business as well, is that uh, having a great product or a great idea is not necessarily the deciding factor on who an investor is going to invest in. So I'm curious, what's your criteria? How do you determine uh, whether you're finding the, uh, the, 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 the land investor or whether they're finding you? How do you determine whether it's going to be a good fit or not? Yeah. So one of the things that I want to know first off is what's their experience? You know, what are they, what's besides what their why is, so now I understand their why, but um, what kind of efforts have they put into their education? Um, have they taken any courses? Have they not taken any courses? Did they learn everything from YouTube? Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we were previously talking about this, but I have uh, someone that reached out to me and said, you know, I learn everything that I can from YouTube. And I think that's great. But there were some simple questions that I was asking him about, what does he think about landlocked properties? Uh, what about floodplains? And he started stumbling when I was asking him those questions or just saying, you know, that's not a big deal. And so that makes me a little bit nervous uh, when I am looking at someone to potentially fund their deals because I want to understand how they're doing their due diligence, what level of knowledge they have. And so I can make sure that I'm actually aligned with them. So I look at their due diligence spreadsheet, see they've got to have something. It's just, you know, how are they, are they just looking at active comps? Are they looking at sold comps? How do they sell their properties? Do they sell them through brokers? Do they sell them on their own? Do they self fund their deals? Uh, most of the time, or are they working with other investors? Um, when they're working with me, for instance, I want to know that they're not like if I, there's a lot of time and energy that I put into on the front end to actually analyze a deal. And so if someone, for instance, if David sent me a deal and said, Hey, I want you to fund this deal, but he was shopping it, or he sent that deal out to all these other land funders, you know, to me, that's a waste of my time. So I want to know what their process is. And then I also want to know how they analyze a deal and uh, what their experience is with the number of deals that they've done. I want to take a look at their website and see, it. number one, do they have a website? Do they have a proper email address or is it just, you know, howardzonder at gmail.com? Do they have an actual business? You know, where are they headed with this? So those are a few little things that I look for um, when I'm kind of checking out whether or not I want to work with a land investor or not.
to fund their deals. So, so let's just say that the, this person who uh, says, you know, I learned everything I learned from YouTube, I, you know, and that's just how I do it. I don't believe in courses. Um, I mean, I watch my son, right? My, uh, he's 12 years old. I don't know where this came from, but he is absolutely crazy about blacksmithing. That is his thing. And uh, we actually cool. built a forge. We got like a whole little blacksmith shop going on outside. Wow. But, you know, like most kids, when he's passionate about something, he watches 10,000 hours of YouTube videos. He knows more than most adults know about blacksmithing. He speaks the lingo. He's, it's amazing what he knows. So uh, why, why is that not sufficient? So you, I think you can learn a lot from YouTube. Um, that's like my go-to place as well from time to time. But it doesn't give you the bumps in the road and that you can potentially experience, especially when you're dealing with money. Like he's doing this as a hobby, right? He's not doing this as a business. He's not doing blacksmithing as a business, right? So there's not, there's not, and he's not using someone else's money, except maybe your money to actually fund his hobby. But um, those are some <laughs> things that I look at is that if, if I was wanting to learn about uh, investing in, I don't know, couch flipping or something. I think I saw something like that <laughs> recently. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I'm the type where I don't have a lot of time and I want to be able to avoid any of the mistakes. And why wouldn't I go to someone that is doing it and doing it well and pay them for their time and say, teach me what you're doing. I will pay you for that time. And then I think the time to productivity or time to learning and being profitable is so much faster than what it would be if I didn't do that. And I continue to spend hours upon hours learning all the mistakes, maybe through YouTube. And I think there's a yeah. lot that probably isn't shared on YouTube that they just share individually um, right. through coaching. Yeah, so yeah. That's what I would recommend. I, I think... Uh, you know, that points to, I mean, there's tons of great information on YouTube. The problem is you don't have a, if you're just going in there new, you don't have a, um, a guide that says, all right, these are all the things that you must know. You don't have any kind of syllabus, right? Where a course is going to be based on everything that person has learned and, and, and uh, learned from their mentors, learned from their experience, and it's put down into bullet points and a in a guide. So uh, it comes down to the, the four stages of, of, of learning, right? You're, you're, you're first, you're ignorant. You don't know what you don't know. So if I go on uh, watching YouTube videos, I'm, I'm ignorant at that point. Okay. Because I don't know what I don't know. So I, I think I've just learned a ton of great stuff and I did, but I don't know what's missing. I'm still ignorant. And then you go to the place where you're uh, you, you, when you know what you don't know, you're, you're just incompetent. Then you, then you start learning that stuff. You develop competency and then you become an expert when you put in so much time. So I think you want somebody who's at least at the competency stage. Um, and that's why the structure of a course, and of course, uh, not just, a, you can only teach so much in a course. I mean, even after you've done, you know, a couple of hundred deals, there's still things that come up that don't know. So, so to be able to get on the phone or text somebody that, you know, you know, whether it's a, a mentor or a mastermind or whatnot, not to, to find an answer um, is, is very important. Um, and, and I just want to stay on that same point. I think as a, as an investor, as the operator, um, I like the fact that my, my funder is being that um, stringent in his criteria. I, I, and and I, want, I know when you and I started talking, we built a relationship, we built a, we, we built a rapport. And I think it's very important because, you know, and you talk about shopping the deals and that's okay, you know, start getting to know the various funders and, and whatnot. But if you're shopping for a percent here and a percent there, that's just not going to fly because there's plenty of people out there who need funding. You know, it's like, no, dude, I'm not going to be 
I'm, I'm not going to play that. It's about building that rapport and that relationship so that when, if, if you get a, get into a deal that gets hairy, you know, you've got some rapport with each other. You're going to work through it. Yeah. I, I'm uh everything all my experiences as an investor working with an, insp- an investor it's it's all about it's not just about even do they know the the craft do they know what they're doing it's about who are they you know if if they're not willing to invest in themselves that speaks a little bit to their long-term intention in the business and their style um you know if i'm going to put my money with them uh I want to know that, you know, they're eating, living and breathing this stuff, that they are committed, you know, both for, for the sake of their own profit, but also out of their commitment to their investor. Um, so a lot of it comes down to, you know, do I believe in this person? Do I believe that they will use my money in this opportunity that we're creating together to, to, you know, to do it. Are they ambitious enough? Do they have the fire in the belly? Are they going to find a way through every roadblock that comes their way? Or are they just going to give up when it gets hard? I mean, these are the kind of things that I want to know with, with, when I'm figuring out who to work with. And, um, yeah. you know, you told, uh, in, in, in the little conversation we had prior to, to starting this, uh, um, read, you told this great little story about how you got into the manufacturer, uh, home business. And, uh, and I, I would love to, if you could just repeat that story a little bit, because I think it is, it is exactly the kind of story that would make me want to invest in somebody. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so graduated from college, um, I was 22 and had a little bit of money um, that I had saved up working as a co-op pre-programmer at, um, at IBM in Boulder, in Colorado. And I was really worried about how frothy the um, housing market was at the time. Uh, And I just didn't, I I had looked at investing in homes, but I just thought, "Mm, I don't know, I'm not sure. And at the, also, I didn't share this with you, but I had the entrepreneurial spirit a little bit before then, because I ran a business teaching senior citizens how to use their computers. Uh, It was called computer educators. Yeah. So talk about like a residual business because most of my clients would kind of forget the information. So it was, it was a great thing for me to continue to drum up revenue. And when you're, you know, 22 and earning between 45 and 75 bucks an hour, it beats working at like any of the other places that you could work at when you're a college student. So I was like, okay, that is working, but what am I going to also do with the money that I'm making? And so I went online, started doing some searches and found a couple different websites and forums that were talking about, you know, houses and investing in houses and stuff. And then I found one gentleman that had a lot of posts about investing in manufactured homes. And basically what he was doing was he was buying a manufactured home for, let's say like 5,000. And then he would turn around and he'd resell it for between 15 and 20,000 at like 11.99% interest on like a five-year term. And a five to seven year term. And then he would get between $400 and $500 a month payments. And so he was doing really well. He had like 75 homes in one community in Colorado that had, and that was just one of many communities that he owned homes in. So basically I saw that I read it as much as I could. Uh, and I, I got addicted to his posts. They were always full of great information. So I just messaged him through the forum and said, Hey, uh, here's my story. I promise not to waste your time, but in the event that, you know, you feel like I'm maybe going to waste your time, just, you know, I'm going to pay you for your time. So essentially I asked him, Hey, can I buy you lunch? And so turns out he literally lived less than a mile away from me. Um, maybe about five to eight blocks away where, from where I was living at the time, which was insane. So he, um, I, I had two weeks before I started my adult job at Deloitte Consulting. And so I basically used that entire two weeks to take him out to lunch, literally Monday through Friday. And he taught me basically the entire business. And then he became my coach. And so one thing I didn't share with you is that at, well, at the end, I bought three manufactured homes and mobile home parks, started doing exactly what he was doing. He connected me with his attorney 
um, we just, it, it worked out really well. But at the end I said, why would you ever, you know, share this whole business with me? Aren't I going to be your competition? I mean, you're in your forties. I'm in my twenties. I'm much more technically savvy than you. And I'm already doing a lot of different things than you. Uh, and I have grand plans to basically buy as many homes as I can. Um, and he said, you know, you'll pay it. I want to pay it forward. Um, and I know you, the world works in mysterious ways and somehow it'll get back to me. And I was like, okay. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And so what was interesting is that he started moving into buying mobile home parks. And when he was buying mobile home parks, they were, um, essentially a lot of them were empty and he needed to buy homes. And so who did he come back to? to find more homes. And so when you, when you bring a home into a manufactured home community where there's no, you know, it wasn't generating revenue, but now it's at, let's say $500 a month at 12 months, that's six grand on a 10 cap, that's $60,000. So if by me selling him five homes at very reasonable prices at, and let's say it's just five homes, that's $300,000 in value that he got in his mobile home park just because of that wow. one chance that he took on taking, you know, spending, you know, two weeks of his time and maybe a few phone calls here or there with a 22 year old punk kid that was willing to uh, take what he learned and move forward with that. So what an awesome yeah. story. I, it is a great story. And I, I, I just love the giver's gain mindset. We have to have that an abundance mindset, giver's gain. You know, it's always uh, just like, in forums and stuff in this business and whatnot, I've got a handful of people who uh, in the land speed community that I helped out early in their uh, business. And, you know, they've thanked me profusely. They're all doing better than me now, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, now I need help from them sometimes, you know, they're right. doing some new stuff that I haven't worked on. And, and, you know, it's like, yeah, what do you want to, you know, you know, uh, there, there's, there's no holds barred. So it's great. Hey Dave, I've got one more um, question before we get into the, how do you analyze a deal thing? If that's all right. Yeah. 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 So in, when working with investors from the perspective of the person seeking the investment, one of the questions we often ask is what is better dumb money or smart money? And oftentimes you can get dumb money cheaper, but smart money is more expensive. And we always have this view in business, you know, I want to always keep my costs as low as I can. So if I can, you know, if I can do a, a deal with this guy over here for 15% debt versus 40 or 50% equity, why wouldn't I do that? But the difference is, you know, what's the value of that smart money versus the dumb money? Can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I have talk to a couple of individuals who have said, well, you know, how about I just give you 10% interest on your money? And I'm like, no, because the market right now also doesn't require that. Um, I've got a number of land investors that have approached me and they're completely fine with the splits that we do, which is usually 45, 55, 55% going to the land investor, 50, uh, 45 going to the land funder. But essentially, um, there's been many times where people will say, well, I want to target this niche. I want to look at, um, I want to buy a land that can accommodate manufactured homes. And so they're using my knowledge there because I'm an open book from that standpoint. They're also getting some knowledge from me because I've taken many different courses and I fund several different land investors. Now I don't share anything specific to their strategies because I've signed an NDA with each one of our land uh, investors, but there's things that I can ask them to say, have you thought about this? What about this situation? Like we ran into a situation with one of the, um, land investors that we funded where they ran into an obstacle with the deed and with a quiet title issue. They didn't know how to handle it. I was able to walk through that with them, give them that advice and save them lots and lots of money or doing a hold open with title insurance or with the title company. They didn't know about that. So that saved them a few hundred dollars here. Um, so mm -hmm. there's, there's different things. And then also with dumb money, 
you know, a lot of the investors or well, only a few of the investors that I know have taken dumb money from friends and relatives. I mean, they're not dumb, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and then yeah. they get phone calls from their friends and relatives saying, Hey, have we sold the land yet? You know, or they have to drag them across the finish line because they're, they're saying, well, and you told me that we were going to get this amount of money, but I, but you're coming back to me with $2,000 less. And with a, an experienced land funder like myself, um, I understand the business and I also understand the velocity of money and I want to keep moving that money. So maybe we do so-so on that one deal. Maybe we don't make as much money, but that one other deal, that one deal can produce three other deals. And so I think it's also how you want to work with those other investors. And if they're simply, if they're simply, if you don't want the experience, if you don't want the, you know, if you feel like you're, you just want the dumb money, that's fine. But there's been so many times where I think the smart money for me has saved that land investor quite a bit of money with some of the challenges that they run into um, with overvaluing a property. A lot of times they've overvalued a property. And um, one person recently came to us and said, hey, we want you to fund us this, fund this deal. We looked at the deal, we talked to a couple brokers they hadn't done, they had talked to just one broker and we found out that this property was like on a lava bed. So, which was really strange, like an old lava bed, part of an old land scam or something, and you couldn't really build on it. So we reached out to a, um, that land investor and said, Hey, did you know this? He said, no, I didn't know this. And I said, it could still be a decent deal, but I would renegotiate the price if I were you. So he renegotiated it down another extra $5,000. So right then and there, maybe we saved him some extra money. I think we saved him some extra money and put some profit back in his pocket too. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, especially people who are a little bit newer, you know, don't have a ton of experience. It, it always helps to have, you know, people in your court. You almost serve as a, an extra uh, team for underwriting or due diligence. And, uh, and, um, you know, I know, uh, when we did a couple of deals together, uh, you, you pointed some things out to me and, and added some significant value. Um, you know, it's, uh, so, uh, especially if people don't have that, that mentor or, uh, friend who's, uh, experienced that they could call up and, and ask about, um, it's, it's nice to get another set of eyes on, on deals, um, I, I, so I, I get a little bit of that with uh, my my acquisitions manager. You know, now she she's got so much experience now, and ha- having worked for a couple of other land investors and, and worked for me before, um, it's we can collaborate on deals, which is nice. You know, I she finds stuff that I miss, I find stuff that she misses, and so you know, it's 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 a solopreneur kind of kind of business, and so anybody you can have. Uh, helping you out like that um is there's there's a lot of value in it um for sure hey folks people often talk about automating and outsourcing your land flipping business but what does that really mean generic solutions leave it to you to figure out how to set up and maintain the automations i've been running my land business on land speed for over three years because it's a total solution and allows me to focus on being a great land investor LandSpeed was built specifically for land investing by a land investor. And with many of the most successful people in the business using it for years, it's evolved into one of the most feature-rich solutions on the market. Some of the key benefits I get are being able to create and manage mail campaigns and neighbor letters. I'm able to automate tasks amongst my team, create contracts and deeds, and email, text, or mail them within a few clicks. I can automatically capture sales leads from any lead source, including Facebook Messenger. Then it automatically pushes those leads into my sales funnel so that I can manually follow up, but they also go into my automated drip campaign. And since LandSpeed's a total cloud-based solution, I can run my business from anywhere in the world with a phone, laptop, or tablet. So if you want to turn your hobby into a professional scalable business just go to landspeedtech.com 
forward slash Dave to receive a $150 discount today. So cool, cool. Um, all right. Well, I just wanted to get into a little bit more of the, the uh, technical stuff and some bullet points that, that, that you had suggested. We got a little bit of time here. Um, I want to talk about, you know, uh, you know, kind of what's the experience like between the, uh, the, the lender and the funder, how you analyze deals um, and things like that. We'll, let's just talk about deal analysis and kind of the, the relationship between the funder and an investor and then uh, talk about some other stuff too. Okay. Um, yeah. So do you want to ask me a question or do you want me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, how do you tip it when, when, a, when, a, when, a, when, a, when an investor brings you a deal, what's, what's your uh, kind of process for analyzing that, that deal and making sure that they've got their, their numbers right? Yeah. So I'll review their due diligence information that's provided by the land investor first. Uh, and then we'll conduct our own research on the market and property, to determine its worth, uh, if it's worth mm -hmm. actually funding. So number one, we'll, I'll ask them for, you know, they can fill out my form if they want to, uh, but generally I like to just see what they do. Um, how do they look at deals? So I'll say, send me your air table, send me uh, an email with all the information. I try not to overcomplicate it. You know, whatever they're using, I want them to just share it. So some people will share their uh, Google spreadsheet and just make me a viewer only um, or send me an Excel file. So I'll look at that and dig into that level of detail. I'll review the location. I'll see if it's in a floodplain, whether it has legal access, what are the volume of sales in the area? What's the activity today? How many properties are on the market? What's the purchase price compared to the projected sales price? Um, let's see, what's the experience of that land investor? How many deals have they done? Is there an HOA? If so, is like, how much is it per year? Are any back taxes owed? Are there any other liens on the property that maybe they are not aware of? Uh, what's the total acreage? What's the slope level? Is the parcel oddly shaped or not? Uh, what kind of restrictions are there with building and zoning? Uh, can they do mobile homes, modular homes, tiny homes, whatever? What are the allowable uses? Does it have water, all the utilities, power, cable, gas, electricity? Um, and then right. so that's some of those things that I look at. Mm -hmm. So basically the due, the, the basic due diligence checklist, and then you're, you're uh, kind of doing your own comps to validate what they're, what they're projecting is the, the uh, sales price. Yeah. And uh, if I know brokers in the area, or even if I don't, I'll usually try to get at least two brokers to tell me what their values are. And you know, I know that a lot of individuals will call brokers and just say, hey, give me an idea of what the value is. And, you know, I just up front tell the brokers, I may or may not use you on this deal. If I, if, especially if it's not my deal, uh, you know, it's, you know, but I, what I do is I just pay it out, them out of my own pocket. I'll say, give me a quick CMA. I'll pay you 50 bucks. Um, and, and I find that it's worth it, you know, at the end of the day, because I, I lean on them in the future. If, for instance, you know, if that land funder says or land investor says, you know, I have my own broker that I want to use. That's fine. That's perfect. I want them to be in the control. But if they don't, then at least I can, uh, you know, or the next deal that I do with that land investor, if that other realtor didn't work out. Now I have a connection there and I can say, hey, you guys should talk but at least they know that I value their time and I'm not just giving them a call to expect that they're going to give me a CMA for free. Um, that I think goes, I like way. that. Great. I like that approach. I like that approach and, and, and paying, paying them a little bit of money for their time to do that is uh, I've never actually heard of people doing that. I think that's, that's actually a good idea. And it also builds the possibility of creating a, a solid relationship with another realtor. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Great. That's a nugget. Yeah. That's a good nugget. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so, so wait, do, so do you have, uh, as an investor, do you have certain parameters to say, okay, I'm looking for deals that fit within these parameters. If it's outside that parameter, I'm probably not the right one for you. Yeah. So 
Generally, we want to sell on cash or for cash. So when I'm working with a new land investor, well, land investors that I've never had a relationship with, yeah, yeah. Um, right. I don't really want to get married to them initially. Uh, so I don't really like to do terms on the front end, uh, just because I don't know what happens if, thankfully with David and I, we're friends, so it's it's not a concern. But if I didn't, you know, let's say I was doing a deal with someone else and I didn't, you know, maybe they're just, ne- we're not a good match. I don't really want to be stuck with them for however long that term of that deal is even. And yeah, there's ways to get out of it. We could sell that note. We could do whatever we want, but um, ideally I like to sell for cash. So if they're not on the same page with me about that, that's probably going to be a no go. Uh, the other thing is that I like to see that the sale term is 12 months or less. If they're thinking it's going to be longer than that, it's probably not for me. Most of the time I, we end up seeing land investors sell their properties within three months or less. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I think it should be 12 months. Uh, I'm, I'm patient enough, especially if it's a more expensive property. Uh, purchase price is usually between 1000 and 250000 But majority of the deals that we're doing are between fifteen and $30,000. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on the purchase side. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, one to 250, that's pretty much the market. That's everything. <laughs> I mean, we're not going <laughs> into the big, big ranches, but <laughs> you know, still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've only at this time we've done uh, one deal that was around 102,000. And then the other deals that we've come across that are higher than that, unfortunately, uh, the comps just didn't work themselves out where we thought that the profit was worth it. Um, so you would expect that the, the properties that are lower in price are going to sell faster. The properties that are bigger in prices, that's where you might be going to the 12 month level. Exactly. Exactly. Um, lot size has to be usually at least 0.1, uh, of an acre. So a 10th of an acre. That would be an infill lot. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Uh, legal access. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Legal access is, is, uh, important. You know, the interesting thing, though, is that we have funded a deal that was landlocked and did really well on it. The thing is, is that those are just far and few between that we found, at least. Um, And then floodplains, certain areas of the country, you're just everything's kind of in a floodplain. But um, so it's not a deal killer, but it's something that we prefer not to do. But if the, the numbers make sense. And the brokers, I mean, we funded a deal recently that's in some wetlands and they, the, the brokers that we talked to in that area were like, that's just common for the area. And I said, is there any concern that you have? Nope, not at all. So I, I try to be a little bit more flexible, but these are some, just some loose things that we look for. And that's a really another good point about smart money. You know, it'd be, you know, knowing to ask those questions about because wetlands, it depends on the area. It's not always a deal killer. You know, for example, uh, you know, I had a one acre property in Florida that I, that I bought. Well, uh, a quarter of the property was in wetlands. Doesn't matter. It's still a great property. You can build a house on it. Just don't build on the wetlands portion. Um, you got three quarters of an acre to work with. You know, Did you, so, what was the story with that? Did you buy it for a good price and then turn around and resell it? Yeah. Yeah. I bought it for a great price and, and just flipped it quick, very quickly. Actually, I think I sold it in a week and, uh, so, yeah. you know, tripled my money. So, um, yeah, no, it's, um, but you know, you, you could get into trouble if three quarters of an acre of that lot was in wetlands, you, you probably won't buy it. And even though you, you might though, if you got it for the right price, you still got a quarter acre to work with people build plenty of homes on a quarter acre, you know, that's you're then point one. <laughs> so you know you just got some nice pretty big three-quarter acre backyard you know and i think i think that's the uh, other thing too with dumb money is that they may be scared or you may have to take them if you're willing i mean depending on how much you want that dumb money or smart money to be involved in the deal for us you know that wouldn't have scared us we just would dig a little bit deeper in the due diligence but if it's dumb money that you're dealing with yeah. and they're nervous Nelly, then you're going to have to hold their hand throughout the whole thing. And so right. is that extra percentage right. worth it? Or are you taking away time from doing more marketing to find more deals? Yeah. Um, time, money, right. and energy. How much 
of your time and energy are you having to give just to handhold and placate an investor? Yeah. Because that's yeah. time and money. Yeah. That's time and energy you're not using towards the business, your family or whatever. Yeah. Right. We, we no, essentially just want the operator to, or the land investor to do their thing. And you just trust for us. We just trust, but verify, and then just get some updates from time to time just to say, Hey, how's it going? And um, that's about it. Uh, we want to let them yeah. do their thing. We, we want to compliment their processes. We don't want them to change it. We don't need to be, we want our phone calls to just be basically, how's it going? Uh, what's new with your family? What's new with my family? We're going on this vacation, that sort of thing. Right. Our, our investors are our friends. Um, it's not so much, oh, well, you, you haven't sold that property in a month, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> I really need my money back. You know, it, we understand that it just takes time. And as long as we see that you're hustling and trying to sell it, you know, that's all that you can do. I just Absolutely. want to comment on something, yeah. an, an observation from the last few minutes of this conversation, because we went by, we went past this so quickly as if it was no big deal. But can you imagine any other business where somebody says, yeah, so I bought the property and I sold it in a week and tripled my money. And we just moved past like, that's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy yeah. <laughs> returns are exactly. very nice in the land investment world very nice compared to like manufactured housing or any of these longer term investments with storage where you get your money back over like a 10-year period yeah. or that's what you're hoping for i mean it's right. totally different yeah, it's funny when I when I when I go to RIA's and uh, talk about it, you know, I said, yeah, I, you know, somebody asked me what's a typical return. I said, well, you know, I get a little disappointed when my when my, when my return's only 100 percent and it takes me more than 90 days to sell it. <laughs> and their, their eyes, what? You know, yeah. So we only have a, a couple uh, minutes yeah, left. Awesome. And uh, there's another question I'd love to ask uh, Kurt uh, Reed. <laughs> <laughs> We got to keep that. We got to keep that in the recording. Like a post-it note on my screen. His <laughs> name is Reed. <laughs> and if we need to do a part two, that's fine. I know that I'm cutting. We experienced some challenges with technology and stuff, but because I, I, if you feel like we haven't dug deep enough, that's fine. I'm willing to. Yeah, that would be great. We, may, we may definitely want to do that. We may do a part two. Yeah. Part two. Um, my, my question is, uh, from the perspective of the land investor, um, there are more and more people getting involved in the investing part, you know, investing in land investors like yourself. Um, how does a land investor vet a person like you, or, you know, let's just say I've got five, five different options of people who want to invest in my deals. How do I vet, uh, a, a an investor to choose the right one? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm surprised about is that um, people don't ask me for a verification of funds letter. So there are some individuals that have come to me recently uh, as more people get into this industry and they get cold feet uh, or the people that they're working with that they think is a, a legitimate uh, land funder. Um, they just get cold feet at the closing. Um, and so that really puts them in a bind. Number one, it makes yeah. the land investor look not professional in front of the title company or title attorney. Um, and then also it causes some challenges between them and the seller. So I think checking out the land funder uh, from a verification of funds letter, number one, you should always ask for that. And if they balk at giving that to you, then that should make you wonder why. The other thing is you would, you should ask for references. You know, any of my, even though I sign NDAs with all of the land investors that I work with, I'm sure that for instance, if someone had reached out to me and said, Hey, who else do you work with? Um, would you be able to give me a reference? I would probably reach out to like David and just say, Hey, do you mind? Um, can I give your information to this person? Um, I, and then have them talk to David. Uh, I, I think also you need to be aligned with, you know, people get really weird about money. Um, I've been in some partnerships in the past where they haven't gone so well. Um, and really it's what happens when the deal doesn't go as well as you thought it would. 
Um, or what happens when things change in someone's world? And you have to account for that. And so luckily our contracts do that, but I'm not a litigious person and I'm not going to sue someone over a $15,000 deal. It's just not worth it. So at the end of the day, I think you need to ask the question of, okay, well, I know that we're saying we're going to sell this property for 15 grand, but what happens if a week later, you know, we only have five into it, but what happens if a week later I get, we get an offer for 12,000 cash? Would you accept it or would you not? And if the funder says, no, we got to stick to our 15 because I think we can get more. And obviously we didn't price it right. Then I would really question that relationship with working or your relationship or desire to work with that land funder. Because I'll give you an example. I had a land investor that we funded. We still fund. And we funded a deal for 3000 he came back to me. We had a minimum price of 17. He came back to me uh, about a week and a half later, I believe, maybe two weeks, and said, Hey, Reed, I know this is not the minimum price that we agreed to, but we got an offer for 15.5 or whatever it was. You know, are you, what do you think about it? And I was like, Take it. <laughs> Don't lose them. Yeah. Sell that yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and, and some funders are not like that. And so for me, even if he came back, since we had three into it, even if he came back at 10, I'd be like, sure, do it. We can create way more deals, but not everybody's like that. Yeah, I, I like that, you know, and so I think if you, if you boil that down, it would be, you know, you get on the same page with each other and talk about your philosophy, your money philosophy. Do you believe in, you know, turning the money or, and you and I did that. You know, uh, we'll, we'll get to know each other. It's like, you're going to hold out for that better price or, you know, let it burn now that, and it's a conversation, you know, uh, you got to have that conversation because, uh, sometimes you might get that cash offer, but you've only had the property on the market for a few days and you're kind of sure. like, mm, you know, let's, we're going to let it, leave it out there a little while. And, uh, and then it's, it's when it starts to drag and you're like, mm, let's move this thing. Yeah. I think the, the other thing too, that is important is that, um, I had an investor, well, as, as a land investor, I think you should ask in typically in these contracts, there's this period of time where you have to sell the property. And if you reach that point, what happens afterwards? A lot of times it goes, the investor can take the prop or the funder can take the property and then the, the land investor just gets nothing or a smaller amount. Yeah. So and you don't think, want to do that because that's also going to just create a yeah. relationship. You're, you're better off to just get on the horn with each other and say, what's the strategy? Let's, let's just blow this thing out. That, that, that's what I was getting to. Yeah. So basically I was working with a, a land investor who basically cut, was coming up on the six month mark. And in our contract, it says that, you know, the percentage has changed. And he called me up and he said, you know, nervous about this. And I said, don't worry about it. Our percentages will stay the same. You're hustling. You're trying to sell the property. Let's just talk about how we can strategize to do, you know, maybe try a couple of different things. Do we need to lower the price? Do we need to get some drone footage out there? Do we need to change up realtors? Do we need to do something else? If a land funder isn't thinking that way, then I would also question, should you be working with that person? Um, cause yeah. I'm in it for not, it's not a transactional relationship for me. Yes. The money is there, but it's all about, you know, a long-term business relationship where we give and take, and I don't care about one deal going sour. I care more about the sum of our deals and the sum of our profit. In our exactly. Relationship. So exactly. And that, and I have to say also, that is such a breath of fresh air because so many finance people that I've dealt with in my career are so driven by numbers on a spreadsheet. You know, I'm sorry, it's, it's black and white. This is what we said. You know, this is what we need to be at. You know, you need to do what you say you're going to do. And, uh, and it's very impersonal and very uh, cold spreadsheet kind of driven relationship. Uh, and, and I think this also gets back to that issue of dumb money versus smart money. Um, if I, if I'm just in it for the transaction, and as you said, transactional, 
um, then really have we met the, the criteria for the transaction or not? And if not, I'm getting nervous. And my goal is to hold your feet to the fire, be thinking that that's going to, you know, make you do what you're supposed to do so I can get my money out because I'm scared because I don't have enough experience to know, you know, to, to know that this could still turn out good or to have a long-term view on the relationship versus the transaction. So um, that's very, very powerful stuff that you said right there. And, uh, and I, I, I think it's, it's much more rare than most people would believe. Yeah. I, I have an example, uh, you know, of, of a little on when I was flipping houses, I had developed, I had done a few houses and, and then uh, I developed a, a good relationship with a, with a private lender. And so he was funding all my deals, hundred percent. And we had a great re- working relationship and I had a deal go South. The construction ran way over. We missed some stuff. Uh, my GC missed stuff that, that was expensive. And, uh, at the end of the day, um, it was I went back to my my funding partner and I said, "Look, this is what the numbers look like. We either need to refinance this and keep it for a while, which I wish we'd have done, knowing what the Denver market did." Uh, but he didn't want to. And I said, "Okay, then I'm going to basically lose twenty thousand dollars to to pay you your guaranteed amount. I'm going to lose twenty thousand um, dollars, or." You can spare me. We can both break even and live to fight another day. You know, you'll get your capital out. You'll make no money, but you won't lose any money. I won't lose any money. We'll both sleep better and we'll live to fight another day. And he agreed. He said, yeah, that's fair. You've brought me a half a dozen good deals. I've made money on them. I want to do more deals with you. You know, I realize that, you know, I don't want you to lose 20 grand. So, um, you know, that, that relationship's really important. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good story. Well, hey, I, I think it's time we got to bring this thing to a close. Uh, Reed, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, what a wealth of information, uh, you know, and, and you're continuing a trend of some, uh, a lot of our recent podcasts of not just are you smart as heck, but, uh, you know, you're just a good guy. And, uh, and I really, it's not just about being a good businessman. It's about being a good man. And, uh, you know, and I, I really like that. And, and, uh, and I want to just tell you how much I respect you and how much, how happy we are that you uh, joined us today. So how can people get a hold of you if they want to, uh, have find the right guy to invest in their deals? Yeah. Um, best way is to, I'm going to give my cell phone number cause I'm still that way. <laughs> I haven't yeah. been burned yet. Um, but my number is three, zero, three, nine, six, zero, eight, five, four, two. So maybe you can put that into the show notes and then Absolutely. Uh, maybe yep. get my email address. I'll give that to you. Or I think David has that. And um, that's the best way to reach me and call, text me. Um, and then I'll get back to you. And even if you don't want me to fund a deal for you, or, you know, we're not a match from that perspective. I just like talking to people about land. It's kind of like, this is what I eat, breathe and sleep. And so um, I always learn something. And so I think it's just a give and take. Perfect. Very cool. Thank you, guys. Awesome, really guys. Your time. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode, had a bit of fun, and walked away with some actionable insights that you can apply to your business. Dave and I have got some great content and interviews planned, so don't forget to rate and review and, of course, subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If we mention any interesting links or tools, You'll find them in the show notes. To learn more about Land.MBA, visit our website at, wait for it, Land.MBA. See you next time on the Land.MBA podcast.